my question is, um, CSIS recently completed a war game scenario on an invasion of Taiwan and how current US and Chinese military capabilities would fare against one another. So to what extent did American cyber superiority or inferiority influence the outcome of that war game? And um, can further improving our cyber capabilities help deter not only attack, attacks against our institutions, but also against our partners, allies, and even unofficial allies like Taiwan? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually work very extensively on cyber and wargaming. Then I know this, um, I know this war game a, a little bit. And um, so here's what's interesting about cyber and campaign war games. Because um, I used to work at the Naval War College, and I spent years with the classified material trying to help them build out what's called adjudication. Like, how do you determine how effective cyber attacks are within the game? So you can make any sort of analysis about how cyber affects the results of the game. I will tell you, it is a hand wave. Um, so generally, what the war gamers are doing is they're coming in with assumptions about what type of cyber capabilities they think might exist and what their effectiveness is. That's not always done with rigor. Um, so when I went back and evaluated what we had done um, in other places, I found, oh my goodness, we used subject matter experts that all had one bias. So we had no actual kind of scientific analysis or um, evidence about what was more or less how it was going to work. So what I've been doing is actually using cyber operations as a variable. And so instead of coming in and saying, well, I think cyber operations are going to do this, or I think cyber operations are going to do that, and then playing it in the game and then making assessments on that, I say, if cyber operations could do this, now run the game. If cyber operations could do that, now run the game. And by holding everything else constant and then changing that variable, then you have a better understanding of kind of, given the parameters of what cyber could do, what is the most devastating, and then what are attacks that aren't going to have a, a huge influence. And, and that work that I'm working on is kind of at the beginning stages, but what we're finding is that the cyber operations that have the largest impact on campaigns are the cyber operations that decrease trust in an overarching information technology. So not a huge input about like cyber operations that make a, a carrier group not work. That doesn't have a large impact on campaigns and actually technically not very likely. But where we see cyber operations really slow down, and, and this is a, would be a big case in China and Taiwan, is where you're reliant on um, centralized information systems and then you don't trust what's inside of it. So that doesn't necessarily mean the cyber operation has to be effective. It just means that I am looking at my information and I can't tell what's true and what's not. And when we input that into the game, we actually see that it slows down um, conflict pretty precipitously. And that can be very advantageous for the United States because the Chinese have a first mover advantage against Taiwan. Um, but for the United States, who's already going to be far behind and deploying troops in that situation, it also can significantly slow down the United States. So you have to build systems that are able to um, allow for trust that doesn't degrade in this way. So this is an ex I, I had an extremely complicated answer for what was a very straightforward question. But the reality is we don't actually know. But my hypothesis is that cyber is going to have the largest effect when it increases uncertainty um, and when it decreases trust and not when it acts like a bomb. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, my question sort of had to do with uh, like the information sharing uh, landscape. So you talk about how um, information sharing is, a, is like a cornerstone of, of cybersecurity. Um, so my question is like how sh does or should the United States go about in sort of choosing and modulating how we make partnerships? Um, is it strictly the same military partners that we've had since you know the Cold War era? Um, or is it like others? Because like with Russia, Ukraine, for example, we see a lot of these partners may or may not have the exact same you know, economic or energy needs or perspectives as we do. Um, so I was wondering in this sort of new digital era, uh, what does the sort of partner shaping landscape or framework look like? Yeah, also a fantastic question. And um, when, when I started working partnerships, I worked partnerships back in 2013 to 2015. We had two criteria. One was, does an existing signals relationship signals information sharing relationship exist. So the National Security Agency has a, a really codified relationship with what we call the 5i partners. So that's um, 
the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. And so we have already built all, out all the legal, technical coordination mechanisms to take any piece of information that is five eyes and give it to them. So that actually worked really nicely for cyber, right? Because we could just take this existing mechanism that we built. That I mean, all these information sharing mechanisms, you have to have computer systems and internet systems that are all approved to that classification standard. I mean, it's a complicated phenomenon. So we, first thing we did is we just leveraged the existing relationships that we already had. And then there were um, more complicated allied relationships. So for example, the NATO relationship. And then we have um, kind of uh, hub and spoke arrangements in Asia. So it's like, for example, South Korea um, and Japan. And so they're leveraging that existing intelligence relationship. NATO, um, some partners in NATO are more, were more um, insistent and about sharing information than others. So the Eastern European countries <laughs> who saw Russia like, and, and had experienced a lot of cyber attacks took a lot of initiative to try and build information sharing mechanisms, some within NATO, but also some that were kind of tangent to NATO or outside of NATO that actually now Ukraine is um, using as a conduit right, to share information. So I think you have to build on the existing relationships because there are kind of the wonky and technical um, coordination mechanisms are already there. But if you only rely on those, then when a situation like Ukraine emerges, or if a situation in Taiwan emerges, because I will tell you, we do not have a great information sharing mechanism with Taiwan, um, then you have to build from scratch. And so I think it is the responsibility of um, stakeholders to figure out not only who are the right countries to build these separate information sharing relationships with, but also how do you quickly take the technical and the policy that you've built and put it on another nation, right? Because we don't know always where the next conflict is going to emerge. Maybe we need to share information with Vietnam. And if we haven't already built out the really boring policy and the technical capabilities, we won't be able to do it. Um, so once again, I hedged on your question by saying that we'll have to invest in policy. Um, but I think we will have to think in the near term on how we information share with Taiwan. Um, because that is actually a complicated um, relationship. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for the talk. I had a question around uh, the, you mentioned the trust factor. How do you view how do you view the individual attacks that are happening on civilians, where a lot of information is leaked out regarding their personal contacts, bank information, etc. And um, how do you view that uh, those attacks which increase the vulnerability of individual citizens in the larger paradigm of strategy and safety of the United States? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, and I will tell you, six years ago, six, eight years ago, the DOD was like, we'll do it. <laughs> Put us in, <info. laughs> we're, we're it's, it's us, it's us. And I think the Obama administration actually made the right choice to say, it is not you. You are the biggest agency, but it is not, that is not your responsibility. So the Department of Homeland Security is increasingly taking a large role in trying to be the information conduit so that it shares malware information, that it shares vulnerabilities across various infrastructures. They've built the information, share, uh, information um, sharing and analysis centers, the ISACs, um, as well as kind of public distribution of information in order to try and get that, the focus there is on industry partners. What is underdeveloped is how we get the federal government to speak directly to um, uh, you know, like the Better Business Bureau or like some sort of representation of individuals outside of infrastructure. That's still really, really undeveloped. Um, and there's probably, uh, that would probably live in the Department of Homeland Security's realm. Um, uh, but it doesn't quite fit under CISA, which is the organization that focuses on the critical infrastructure. So I think you've identified something that the future strategy really needs to be able to, um, to build an office for. I don't know if some of you heard, but DHS was trying to build like an, an information warfare operations kind of council within DHS and it didn't it didn't go very well the way that was um, put out so they're gonna have to think about what the role of the federal government should be because there's uh, generally some concern about the federal government overreaching oh, 
Yeah, um, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, when we're talking about this issue of mitigation and resiliency and defense, um, do you see any pathway towards possibly achieving that vision of cybersecurity or internet communication where there's more collaboration rather than having to focus on like more mitigation related stuff between countries like China and the US um, in the near or distant future? Um, well, be between China and the US, I do not. Um, but I don't think that has to do with cyber, I think it has to do with political. Um, I think cyber will follow whatever the political um, world is. And the US-China relationship seems to be getting worse, not better. So we can expect that that cyber relationship is also going to deteriorate. Um, I, I would say that I don't see all the optimism of the Obama 2011 strategy. But I do think that the lesson we can take from Ukraine is that if you invest in information technology and resilience, cyber attacks can still occur and have less of an impact on society. So I am optimistic that we can come to a place where not that cyber attacks are gone, but that we don't have to worry that they're going to um, suddenly like ruin the foundation of everything that we've built. And I am optimistic that that can occur. Thank you. Hi, um, my question's kind of a twofer. Um, on a scale from one to 10, how critical is the dark web in protecting US cybersecurity? And with the emergence of deep fake technology, hacking personal webcams, et cetera, do you think there are ethical challenges to educating the next generation of cybersecurity professionals? Dark web is extremely important because that's where the vulnerabilities lie, that's where the vast majority of criminal activity is occurring, so extremely important. Um, also important is the currencies that they use in order to make money. And that's actually where the US government has been most effective is in cutting off their access to cryptocurrencies. Um, so that was not the question, but I'll throw the cryptocurrencies in there. And then um, I, I do think there are a lot of ethical obligations. Um, I think the Obama administration actually focused a lot on the ethical obligations of internet technologies. Um, but I think that there could be, I, I, ethical doesn't usually work in the long run, that's my cynical, and um, I think that once uh, companies find that it hurts their bottom line, um, then they will, be more, uh, they will be more invested in cybersecurity. So if I have a young baby and I know that that baby monitor is gonna get hacked, I don't wanna buy it, right? Well, that's a very strong rational incentive for a company to build in cybersecurity. So there, I think there are economic ways in which you can actually create um, uh, or incentivize ethical uh, decision-making when it comes to building in cybersecurity inside um, IoT. Thank you. 